our upline leaders used his death to promote Arbonne. My name is Jennifer. I was in Arbonne for eight years and I left just last year. Got it. So what got you into Arbonne? What was going on in your life at the time that you joined Arbonne? So my background is in social work. I was recruited into Arbonne by a friend from college. She had reached out to me through Facebook, a Facebook message. This was not common at that time. It wasn't like it is now. So it just kind of seemed like two friends catching up, which I thought that it was. And she told me that she had started a skincare business and that she was looking for someone to test out the products that she was using. They had completely transformed her skin. I knew her from college. I knew she had struggled with her skin. So I was like, sure, send me some free samples. And so she sent them to me. At the time, I had actually just found out that I was pregnant with our second child. And in the back of my mind, I was, there was a part of me that was kind of worried about how I would juggle my career with two kids because like a lot of moms, I felt like I was just kind of like trying to keep my head above water. And, and so there was this, this feeling of how am I going to be able to do this really demanding, emotionally exhausting job with two kids when I feel like I'm barely holding it together with one, I had very little flexibility in my job. And I was on call every other weekend as well. So putting in a lot of hours, I was not afraid to work hard. And um, so there was that, though I she didn't reach out to me for any sort of opportunity at that point. And she sent me the samples. I threw them in a drawer. I didn't have time to wash my face. I didn't have time to do any of that. And she kept calling me to use the samples. And when I used them, I had never used any sort of high quality skincare. And I was used to kind of falling into bed exhausted as a mom, as a social worker. And so using it, taking that time to pamper myself felt amazing. And I told her that I said, I really enjoyed using the product. And she said, well, if you enjoy them that much, you can actually make money by telling right. other people about it. And I was like, wow. And at that point, it just seemed like a little bit of money. It, it didn't really seem like something that could replace an income of any kind. She didn't make any income claims at this point. And so she was like, why don't you get on a call with a friend of mine who's been doing this a little bit longer than I have? And I'm like, sure. And looking back, hindsight's always 2020. The other thing about being a mom is it can feel very isolating. And you like long for friendships outside of, you know, just being with you like mom friends or even with your kids all the time. And so this kind of idea of like meeting all these women who seemed like really successful appealed to me as well. And I'm like, Hey, if nothing else, I'm just, I'm going to get on a, on a phone call with a, a professional driven woman like myself. And she told me that her upline, which was a word I'd never heard before, but it, it didn't raise any red flags. I just, she, her upline was a wall street executive who left wall street to build her network marketing business that she was really smart financially and that she was doing this business. She had two kids. She started when she had two kids. I was about to have my second child. And so I'm like, wow, just like everybody, I'm like, wow, this is a sign. <laughs> this is like, right. this is really great. And so I get on this call and and I do remember feeling this right from the first call. All of a sudden it went from me buying a skincare set to investing in all of these household products and what's known as like arbonizing my home. Oh my God. 
And so now it was like, there's all these toxins in your products and, you know, you don't want to be putting them on your baby's skin or your kid's skin. And maybe the reason you're exhausted all the time is because you're taking in all these toxins and all these skincare and these hair products and this makeup that you're using. And it was just instill fear right away. And right. she shared stories of how like it transformed her health. And then they did something that I now see is very manipulative, but it was like, do you see yourself as a social worker like forever? Yep. You know, when you envision yourself five years from now, what do you see? And the all I saw was exhaustion. And I thought, well, that's that's not how I want to live my life. And she said, well, what if you could raise your kids and do this and be a more present mom? Isn't that what you'd want? Didn't you say, because she asked me about my job, mm -hmm. didn't you say that you're on call all the time? Didn't you say that your job is really emotionally exhausting? And I'm like, yeah, I, I guess I did say those things. And all of a sudden I went from just wanting to buy skincare to, I mean, I'm not going to lie, like, <sighs> kind of seeing myself driving the white Mercedes. Right. And I was like, wow, I, and I, I told her how hard I worked and she was like, you're perfect for this. You're so bubbly. You have such a great personality. You're a hard worker. You know, you, you have, you have a why your kids can be your why. And I signed up with the biggest package and I started my business. So they just checked all the boxes from from day yeah. one. She edified this wall, supposed Wall Street upline uh, that impressed you. She preyed on what was already existing in your life as maybe a point of uh, vulnerability. You know, your strenuous work schedule, your uh, identity sort of questions that you had regarding motherhood and friendships and things of that nature. And they just, you know... They had you, they, 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 it was, it's such a, it, it's sad to me because this, your story is unique to you. You, you have a unique story that nobody else has in terms of the specifics, the company, the money you spent, the things that you saw. But unfortunately there are so many women that got into it the exact same way and they use motherhood and they use getting older as a way to like sort of convince you it's subterfuge, right? It's like, do you really want to be, I've heard them say stuff. Do you really want to be 50 years old and doing X, Y, Z? And it's like, you know, isn't this supposed to be about, like you said, me washing my face? Isn't this supposed to be about skincare? So uh, there's a lot of information there, but I want to, I want to try to sort of keep this, um, you know, keep, keep track of where, where I want to go with this. So, you signed up with the biggest package. What was the initial investment mon like financially for that package? And then after you signed up, how quickly did this become your whole life? How quickly did you urbanize everything, leave your social work job and you know begin this eight year journey of being a boss babe? It's embarrassing how quick it all happened. I mean, it was it was fast. Um so it was a $2,500 investment to urbanize my home and have what was known in Arbonne as your little gold bag. They were the, the employees that worked for you. And what it was is like, I actually have one um, back here. It's the, still have it. Oh, wow. It's a bag filled with skincare that you would drop off to people to be able to use for a few days. And you needed to have the more, they pitched it to you that the more employees, meaning gold bags that you had, the faster you could grow. So they wanted you to invest in at least four gold bags. If you could do four, then you'd go really fast. And also I had just found out I was pregnant and it was, and I had disclosed that to this friend of mine. And in her defense, she's still like, I still hold her near and dear to my heart. She is still in Arbonne. 
but she was brand new. She didn't know what she was doing. She was just doing, she was just following the people ahead of her. She had only been in for a few weeks when she recruited me. So um, she had told me that she also got the biggest package and that if, you know, if I could do four gold bags, that that would be really quick. And I was about to go on maternity leave. And they were like, imagine if you could have income rolling in before you go on maternity leave. And I'm like, oh yeah, that would be amazing. So I went all in. And that's also, I know other people have shared, like it was kind of like my personality. If I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it hard. I'm going to hit it hard. Like go big or go home. And like often when I do things, I go all in with something. And that's what I did. And they also said that you you needed to have products in your home that, that were Arbon because you didn't want people to come over and see that you were using other things. The other thing that was really weird and kind of set off red flags in the beginning, but I just ignored it, was I had liked other cosmetic lines on Facebook. So, you know, like, <laughs> I know you're young, but like, do you remember the old Facebook where it would show like, Jennifer likes yes. whatever in your timeline. Mm -hmm. Well, this was in 2014. And apparently I had liked some other cosmetic brands and it showed up on these uplines timelines. Cause now they're, now we're friends on Facebook and she messaged me and I had been in like less than a week. She was like, you know, it doesn't look good for you that you're liking, you know, it cosmetics and Revlon and Fendi and Fenty and all these things. So I'm like, okay. So I unliked all of those things thinking that it's going to make me a better, I mean, it's, it's insane. It's part of a control. Uh, they also told me not, not to swear on my social media. So they went through my social media and saw that I was swearing and they were like, they were like, this doesn't, you know, this really doesn't fit with the Arbon brand. Like this is the first month I joined. And so those were some red flags looking back. But yeah, I, I got the biggest package. I was told book as many events as you can in the first two weeks, because not only will this investment put you in qualification for your first promotion, which is already going to be halfway to your Mercedes and your Mercedes, which was pitched to me as that's the place in your business where you're going to have a business that works for you. So you don't even have to be working it anymore. It's just going to be residual income. And I'm like, wow, okay. I booked uh, parties. And actually at this time, I thought I was selling product. So I had, in my mind, I'm like, I'm buying these products so that I can sell them because I had like most people, I, or a lot of people, I'm like, you, when you go to a store, you buy the product off the shelf. I honestly didn't realize that these are, this was all supposed to be so I could become a product of the product. And I learned that at my first party when my uplines uplines so the woman that i had spoken to in that first call uh she had said oh no everyone will order online and um you know it ships directly to them and it was kind of framed like that makes it super easy for you and for them you don't have to deliver anything but i'm like thinking like well what about all this product that i have like half of it i don't even i wouldn't even use personally and they're like, well, you can use that for presentations uh, and to become a product of the product yourself. And giving to other people to like your friend yes, gave you yes, the samples. Like, yeah, exactly. And they wanted you to purchase. So Arbon did offer samples, but you didn't get QV for samples. So they wanted you to purchase full size product and they made it sound like you were giving people a really special in-home spa experience. Like, would you rather get a sample sent to you or would you rather have a full size set? So they said, only get samples for people who don't live near you, but you wanna have these full size sets to be able to share with people. So at my first event, again, I'm thinking that I'm selling product someone wanted to join. Someone was like, 
hey, I really like this. How long have you been doing this? I'd love to do this too. I didn't even realize it was a thing. I'm like, uh, well, I don't really know if you can do this. And so I called my, here's me showing my age. I'm doing my phone, but <laughs> I called uh, my upline and I'm like, someone here wants to do this too. And in my head, it did not make sense. I'm like, why would, why would I have somebody else doing this? She right. was like, no, that's great. She totally fed into my ego. She's like, see, I told you, you were a natural at this. You already have your first teammate. You're already building a team. So this person signed up and her and I did this together. Right. And it was two of us and it felt like everything now just doubled. Like, this is like my <clears throat> first month. Okay. So hold on. I want to jump in here. So if we look at the Steve Hassan bite model, right? Behavior, information, thought, emotion. These are the types of things they try to control. These are the four pillars, right? Behavior, that was already checked off by them telling you don't swear, um, you know, don't like yeah. those certain pages on Facebook, you know, use your bubbly personality, which is a contradiction from them saying in your first call that you're a perfect fit. If you're a perfect fit, presumably there's nothing that you need to change. So yeah. that's that's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, I guess this would also fall under behavior as well. You getting rid of everything and you urbanizing your household items so that you become a product of the product. You're surrounded by it. Information, basically, I mean, that's going to that's gonna come later when you talk about the uh, uh, seminars, trainings that you attended. They had emotion because they were preying on the fact that you were a newly pregnant mom again and you had this why of not wanting to do social work those were emotional triggers so already very quickly in your first month alone they were talking about you know they're checking all the boxes what i wanted to ask was because this was moving so fast did was there ever a conversation like between you and your husband about like a career change or like was there any concern brought up from anyone around you close to you about like how quickly you were getting into it was there ever any doubts like anybody trying to tell you hey I heard about this thing like yes my my husband knows my personality and he know he knows that I go all in on things and he was concerned more about this taking up a lot of time because he already knew that I was working a job on call every other weekend I, it was a very emotionally exhausting job. It was social work. I was actually working with abused and neglected children. And so I would often take that work home with me. I'd get called out in the middle of the night. And so he was concerned that perhaps I was going to take this on and it was going to take me away from myself really like any time that I had for me it wasn't that he was concerned it was going to take it away from him maybe he didn't express that but it was like and I and I just shrugged it off I'm like it's just going to be this little thing to ha so I can bring in just a little bit of extra before I go on maternity leave and, and that he could get behind but when I recruited that first teammate right away I kind of caught the bug for because I saw my business kind of double very quickly. And I caught the bug for recruiting and I was very coachable. So I, all of a sudden, speaking of information control, I was like, I've got to learn everything I need to learn about Arbon so I can be the best consultant I can be so that I can get this rolling before I go on maternity leave. So I was listening to training calls on my way to work. I was on my way home. Like, you know, when I'm getting ready in the morning, I did not miss like a team call. And I became kind of this poster child for what everyone should do. Recruit somebody at your first event, plug into all the calls. Like, look at Jennifer, this small town social worker making it happen. She doesn't have a lot of people in her town. She's already recruited. Like, I think within my first couple months, I ended up having four people on my team. So and was it the first month that you quit your social work job? No. Okay. So it, it wasn't until I was on maternity leave. So I my see. business is growing and there was always this little like, bug in my ear from my uplines, plural, because there's multiple people saying like, 
this could really like replace your job. And when I went on maternity leave, I didn't want to go back like a lot of moms, you know, this was really growing. I had art I had reached now the second level of management, which is area manager within my first six months. And I was told, they were like, if you're already at area manager, which is halfway up the compensation plan, which looking back now, I was only making like two to $4,000 a month. And if that's halfway up the compensation plan, that's not really much. And so I'm like, this is only going to grow. So I made the decision, like I burned all my boats and I'm like, I'm not going to go back to work. This is only going to grow because if I'm doing this well, working this part time and while having a new baby and like, look at me, I'm such a rock star. Imagine what I'm going to be able to do if I just like do this full time. And I did. Right. And I didn't grow beyond that level for four and a half years. Can I go back to one thing? I want to talk about how what you mentioned about when you were asked if this person at the presentation could join and you said, oh, I wasn't sure about that. That doesn't really make sense to me. I'm sure looking back now, you you get this, of course, but at the time you already had it, the common sense that if our goal is to sell products, it would only hurt me to recruit my next door neighbor or my friend to sell the same thing I'm selling to the same network in the same territory or whatever, it's going to be less of the pie for me. It doesn't make any sense. And then when they told you, oh yeah, just bring them on. This is a good thing. They're joining your team. You sort of, that sort of went away. But now looking back, I, I'm sure you realize that it's because it's not about selling products. It's about recruiting people. And that's what makes it a pyramid scheme and not a legitimate sales business. So, but it's just interesting to me how uh, you're the first person I've talked to that said that had like a, an initial doubt about like recruiting people to begin with because it didn't really make business sense. And that, that, that instinct was a hundred percent correct. Yeah. And I ignored it. Yeah. Because yeah. from the beginning, you're kind of made to feel like everybody already in Arbon knows more than you. Doesn't matter what kind of marketing business like acumen you bring to the table, everybody who's already in and already recruiting knows more than you. Well, of course. And they they galvanize that by having these strategies, like they edify the person above them. Like who's to say whether that person who did the initial call with you was really a Wall Street executive? Maybe they worked at a Starbucks that was on Wall Street or something. Like You know what I mean? Yeah. The, technically they were maybe, a, they worked on Wall Street, but- uh, and also the fact that they have all these titles for their ranks, like area manager, like, okay, what area, what's the area, you know, <laughs> I'm doing a, I'm doing an investigation on a company right now. And they have a term for one of their lower ranks called regional leader. Like, okay, what's the region? What region you're recruiting people all over, all over the city, all over the country, wherever you could recruit somebody in the United States if you wanted to, I'm in Canada. So what, what region it's just, it's just pretend business to sound fancy you know uh you said area yeah area manager area i don't know all manager, the names yeah. of the ranks in arbon but i'm sure it sounds more glamorous as you get higher up and again it's just like it's a thought stopping technique like oh no no this guy's an area manager he's got he's got a team of this many blah 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 six figure seven figure like all these buzzwords and uh, again it's all it's all just a game it's like a little like professional wrestling like it's a little pretend show i don't go back to work after my maternity leave because the next step is regional vice president wow like, talk about fancy titles and the next step is the mercedes the white mercedes and it has to be white everything in arbon there's a thing about purity in fact, their slogan at the time was pure, safe, beneficial. Everything was about whiteness and purity, which is a whole nother messed up thing that we could get into. Because when you went to these events, all you saw was a bunch of white women. It wasn't until like the last few years where there was a little bit of diversity because I think they kind of were scrutinized for that. But there was this whole underlying message, speaking of information control, about whiteness and purity and Christianity and 
totally right totally weird not that there's anything weird about christianity or any of that but i just mean like the indoctrination of it right in a business opportunity is weird i went all in and i had this baby but i worked i worked all the time i thought about arbon all the time i went to every training event um i listened to every training call i mean i ate slept and breathed arbon I was, there's a saying in Arbonne that it, it was first you're in Arbonne and then Arbonne is in you. Insane. <laughs> this was something that was preached. And when uplines would say that to people, it was like, oh, like you, you're anointed. Like it's, it's now in you. You're like a true believer. And so I was so all in that I even went to industry events. So I started, there was a point in my business where it was like, well, maybe I'm, I even envisioned myself on stage speaking on behalf of the industry. And so I followed Eric Worre and I was in his Facebook group and his Facebook like coaching group. And he was doing a Facebook Live and he had put out this contest and he called me out as an earner, a VIP earner. I, I won this contest to come to his GoPro Recruiting Mastery in 2018 as his distinguished VIP guest. I had to pay for my own hotel, my own flight. The only thing that he gave me was a ticket to his event. What'd you <laughs> have to do? Sorry, what'd you have to do to win the contest? Like proclaim that you were going to prospect a certain amount of people <laughs> and then also share like who you had recruited that month. Okay, okay. So anyways, go on. You paid for everything except nobody, the ticket. Nobody checked to see whether I didn't lie, but nobody checked to see whether it was legit. Either. <laughs> of course, of course. But, but so I'm like, oh my gosh. Like, again, this is a sign that I'm going to be an advocate for the entire industry of network marketing. So I go to his event and I'm actually in the promo video for GoPro Recruiting Mastery mm -hmm. 2018. <laughs> and I actually wasn't even really treated like a VIP, which was so weird to me. I paid for my own ticket. And I paid for my own flight and I did not get to sit on the floor. I sat up in the bleachers like, and I got to go down for like pictures near the million dollar hall of fame, but I didn't get to really, and I got to be in the promo video to share like how amazing my experience was, but they never asked me what I learned. Cause if you, if you asked me what I learned, I have no idea, but at that event, I, I, I mean, I felt like I was mingling with all these top earners in the entire industry. And that's where I was introduced to Ray and Jessica Higdon. They were speakers at that event. And I had been stuck. This is 2018. So I left my job in early 2015. Okay. So now I'm three years stuck at the same level in my company. And because of all the indoctrination, all the training calls I'm listening to, I'm, I'm totally believing it's me. And I was even told by people, you don't have the belief that you had when you first joined, you're stuck mentally, you're stuck emotionally. You need to get out of your own way. So I'm like, I need a coach to help me. Of course. So I signed up for rank makers because what stuck out to me at the time, like hearing Ray and Jessica speak on stage at GoPro was they were funny. They were so funny. I thought Ray was the funniest ever. And now I'm like, ugh. <laughs> but I was so used to these uppity, like women in Arbonne who like just could never like take a joke and were just completely uptight. I like longed for humor and like having some fun that wasn't just like, oh, let's dance at um, the Arbonne white party, which is really a thing. Right. And um, like pretend we're having fun when we're really just all jealous and bitchy. <laughs> like, but 
So I like, I'm like, I've got to join rank makers. Okay. Before so, we go on to rank makers, I want to say one okay. thing about, about the GoPro events, right? So these GoPro yeah. events are events where the tickets can cost more than a thousand dollars, depending on the package you buy. And from what I understand, there's no real special incentive to buying a more expensive ticket, except that you sit closer. And then if you sit closer, <laughs> Eric might pick you out of the audience to, you know, bestow some wisdom upon you. But honestly, based on your retelling of the story, it's really not surprising to me that you didn't get a VIP treatment because VIP, I mean, if the titles of the ranks in Arbon are any indication about how meaningless these words are, then the term VIP is also meaningless. It doesn't mean anything. You know, there's VIP. You might think, oh, that means the best of the best. But then you'll find out that there's diamond deluxe quadruple, you know, platinum VIP. And you're like, oh, whoa, what's, you know, I didn't even realize. And uh, with Eric, did you even get to like meet him personally? What was that conversation like? Okay, so no. And also another thing that confuses me is like, why would it why would it help a person in a company like you were in Arbonne? Why would it how would it help you to go to an event and talk to high earning people who are in completely different companies? It's not like they're your upline. It's not like they have the power to move you from where you are in the pyramid up higher. So I don't really see the the point to it. You know what I mean? Like I don't understand what the upside is. Like you could say, okay, well, I learned from, you know, the speeches that were given or whatever. But in terms of the actual networking aspect of it, I mean, I think it's pretty useless. Like I could I could watch those uh I could watch Eric Worre's speech on YouTube, which funny enough, he uploads them to YouTube after the fact. So why would I spend $1,000 to go to it? Like two things. Number one, you're told, put yourself in these spaces around these people because you are the sum of the five people that you hang around with. So if you put yourself around these people, and I'm not saying this is legit, right. I'm saying this is what you're told. So that's how you believe it. And then you buy the ticket. The second thing is what they're really selling is personal development. And that product like is supposedly like priceless. You can't put a price tag on that. And so by you investing and going in this event, you're growing yourself, which will grow your business. And obviously that is completely false, it's but it such... keeps you stuck in a loop. It's such horseshit. First of all, if I go to a concert and there's a lot of wealthy people there, was I was I hanging around those people or did I just happen to be in the same place? Like, was there some energetic aura of wealth that came off of them that rubbed onto me because we breathed the same air molecules that night? Like that that point about being around, you know, the you're the sum of the five people you hang around with. That's valid. But you weren't really hanging around these people. You were just in the same place as them for a few hours. And then in terms of the self-development, you're totally spot on. That is the product. That is what they're selling. And Eric Worre is kind of a genius for that because he's not advocating on behalf of one company. So he's able to collect money from people throughout the industry, regardless of what company they're in. And he is <laughs> it's really amazing because he's just spewing the same motivational babble that you could hear on a Wednesday night Zoom call from your upline who uh, is 21 years old and had, you know, worked one or two jobs before this anyways. And people are paying $1,000 for it. So I got to give credit to Eric Worre. He's done he's done a, something genius in, in convincing all these people to go along with his little, you know, baby's first business play set pretend adventure of being a, a businessman uh it, it's it's just really incredible and and with the other thing with self development is that no one's ever done no one's ever done self improving so it's an infinite thing he could sell it to you year after year after year and they'll just say they could just say what they said to you, which is you're in your own way your mindset isn't the same as it was you need to unlock something within yourself as though me going and listening to Eric say, well, you know, you need to envision yourself as the main character in the movie is going to change my life. Like just it's bullshit, bullshit.
it's horrifying now listening to him and to think that I just was so enamored and I, <laughs> I hung on his every word right. and even worse than him, I hung on Ray's every word. So I joined yes. Rank Makers and I, in Rank Makers, Ray does a live video every day. It's called the Ray Daily. And I get in there and it's just like love bombing. And it's like, you introduce yourself. That's like the first step in all of these groups. You introduce yourself and you cut, you have to share, like, why did you join this group? Like, what are you looking to get out of it? And you get love bombed again, just like when you first started in your MLM. So it just feels like so good again. And you just feel so motivated and emotionally um, just like hyped up. Yes. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like this is a community of people. Again, I'm like wanting to make an even bigger impact beyond Arbon. So I'm thinking I'm like, I'm like advocating for the whole industry of MLM now. This is so cool. And it's like from the very beginning, you've got to, to be a rank maker. You've got to be coachable, tune into the Ray daily every single day. So I did that. I tuned in every single day. I did his daily action step. And the thing that really appealed to me again, so First, it was Ray's humor and he was kind of goofy and whatever. The other thing was he actually gave like tangible action steps. And I was really used to in Arbon a lot of this fluffy, you've got to like believe kind of thing. And I don't come from like a religious like family upbringing or anything like that. And so like that stuff actually always just felt a little weird to me. But I do believe in like a higher power. Like I, I do believe that you got to have faith and, but, but it always felt really weird. Like, what am I believing in kind of thing? Right. So and, vague. Yeah. And so I, cause at the time I didn't realize it was like the ideology or the doctrine <laughs> that I'm actually believing in. And so with Ray, he was like, you know, it's Tuesday, do a live video. It's Monday, write down your goals. It's Thursday, follow up with 10 people. So it was like tangible action steps. I'm like, I did every single one. And within 30 days, I had my biggest personal sales month. And I attributed it to him. This all-knowing, <laughs> omniscient, powerful guy, this MLM leader. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I, this is it. And really what it was is I learned new ways to manipulate people. His verbiage and his scripts are, he's a master manipulator. And that's yeah. what I learned. Yeah, that's, I, I agree. Like people sometimes try to push back on me and say, well, Marco, if it's such a scam and you know, people are destined to lose money, how come some people join and they actually do I think it is possible to grow in an MLM. And the way you do that is by being willing to lie bigger and more frequently and deceive more and turn off your human conscience. That's why I really, really, really believe if you look at the top people, the people that start the companies and the people who are like in the top 0.1%, 0.9%, whatever, that less than 1%, if you look at those people, I do believe the majority of the people that are the top, top earners in MLM companies are psychopaths. I believe Eric Worre is either a sociopath or a psychopath. Uh, Ray Higdon, absolutely, I believe, is a sociopath or a psychopath. Because if you have no sense of right or wrong, no conscience, you don't care about what happens to people, that's what that means. That's, that's what that makes you. And you cannot be so high up in an MLM company or a you know, rank makers type thing where you're training people about personal development. You cannot be that high up without witnessing with your own eyes the amount of people that are being churned up, churned out, and, you know, just losing money and being spit out by this machine every single year and seeing the people spending their last dollar to go on a Zoom call with you. You can't not see that if you're that high up in a company and you have to be okay with, you have to be okay with knowing that people are out here spending their last dime on 
the plane ticket and the hotel to some bullshit event. And they're going back home to another maxed out credit card and like trying to just eat noodles and sleep on somebody's couch. And like for you to know that you're contributing to that and there's really no way for the people to get out of it and you're sleeping soundly at night, you have to be a psychopath. I think like, you know, it might sound dramatic, but I think if we were able to force forcibly sit Eric Worre and Ray Higdon down in front of a, a professional who was able to diagnose them, I think that that is what we would find. Absolutely. And they don't tell you you're going to, in order to earn the Mercedes, you're going to have to lie. They don't, they didn't say that in the first call. It's just that the deeper I went in, the more it started to mean to me. So when something, it's like kind of like do or die, you're will, you get to this place where you're willing to do things that you never would have done. And you didn't even realize because in the name of personal growth, you think that you're now becoming this successful, like committed business owner. And yeah. so there were things that like, I didn't know I was being deceptive. Now looking back by the time I woke up, I realize that now. And I've been asked like, "Will you earn the Mercedes?" So it has to work. Like, what do you, why do you think it worked? And there's a couple things. Number one, I was the first one in my area to do Arbonne. Uh and so that I also joined like right before the wave of social media. So I got in like before people were annoyed as shit about getting messages on Facebook. So that worked to my advantage as well. And then the third thing is I had the money to invest in a coach who taught me how to manipulate people <laughs> just better than maybe some other people were taught. Can, can I ask you about income versus expense Yeah, absolutely. Uh, things that's yeah. going on at this point? So like what, I mean, first of all, the time investment, Ray is doing a live every day and you're, you're on that live for, I don't know how long it goes for. And then you're also doing your own lives with your company. And then whatever other prospecting and follow-ups and Zoom calls with new prospects that you're doing, like time freedom, where? So what I want to know is how are you, how much are you spending each month with Arbon on like your auto ship? And, you know, tell me what the costs were like each month with that. And then with rank makers, how much were you spending each month? And then you know, whatever other expenses, travel events, whatever. And then how much were you actually making and how did that break down? The truth is, is that I didn't really realize that I wasn't making any money until I actually, because once I became a coach for Ray, I wanted to be the best coach that I could be. And I'm kind of getting ahead of myself because after like having success, then I was asked to be a coach, but I invested, then I got down a Tony Robbins thing and at a Tony Robbins event, I was told to do a profit and loss, which actually was a huge part of me waking up. Shout and out to Tony so, Robbins then. Yeah. <laughs> I have my criticisms yeah. of Tony Robbins too, and, and him sort of selling his uh, influence to people who I think have less than righteous intentions. But anywho, that is a good thing on its own there. Yeah. He, and I, I, I'm a graduate of Tony Robbins Mastery University, which whatever that means, it means I spent a lot of money to say that right? basically, but in his business mastery, one of, on the first day you do a profit and loss. And I realized, oh my God, I am not making any money. So I thought I was bringing in like $6,000, five, $6,000 a month, um, like with coaching and Arbon. And, but I spent $15,000 to do Tony Robbins coaching. I spent $5,000 to do, um, <laughs> yeah. Go on, go on. I spent $5,000 to get coaching from Ray. I was paying $20 a month in rank makers. I was spending about $500 a month just bare bones in Arbon to re arbonize my home. So get like shampoo conditioner for my kids, the protein shakes I needed, which now make me gag. I can't even, they're behind me. I can't even drink them anymore. Um, the energy fizz, like everything. So me and my whole family is using all these things. And I think I cannot live without them. 
Marco, when we would travel places, some women have like an extra suitcase for shoes. I had an extra suitcase for Arbon. I could not not have my protein shakes, my fizz, right. my all of that stuff. So my fish sticks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I was five hundred dollars, but then if it was like new product launch, those were like thousand dollar months, you know, because you had wow. to get all the new products. And actually, in Arbon, you were. Taught, and I've made content about this on like my TikTok and Instagram. You're told you don't just need the new products for yourself, you need to have another set to give as gifts, you need to have another set to sample, and then you just need to have a backup set because everything's going to sell out. Right. So, so you so, want to make sure you have. We, we were encouraged oftentimes to buy four sets again, like those four bags. That was already indoctrinated. Four is the magic number. Insane. And so the first thing about you needing the products everywhere you went, that's just crazy to me how they had you so sold on the idea that like everything is poison. Like just yeah. the fear mongering, like even the word toxin is like an unregulated term, like toxin, chemical, every virtually everything has a chemical in it. Virtually everything is that we eat, that we use is derived at least in part from chemicals chemical doesn't necessarily mean bad like the word bacteria is often used to only mean bad there is good bacteria just like sugar there are good sugars and labeling is such a uh, misleading thing because in the grocery store things that say they are sugar free that doesn't necessarily mean they're actually without any sugar i think the actual meaning is just that there's no added sugar of a certain type, I think cane sugar, but they still have like all the shit you can't pronounce type sugar when it says sugar free. So MLMs will often use these words that don't really have any precedent to back them up. Toxin, uh, sustainable, uh, clean. What does that actually mean? If you say something is vegan or gluten free, you actually do have to prove that it is vegan or gluten free. Like you have to be able to get that certified and show your ingredients and whatever. But using all these words, toxin, chemical, clean, green, it doesn't actually mean anything. This was actually something that really helped me like wake up and I'll, and I'll get back to like the profit thing, but yeah. I'll say this real quick. This, the 30 days to healthy living program with Arbon actually was a huge like thing that made me step away from Arbon and actually take time to critically think was because I noticed like, I wouldn't go out with friends without like knowing what was on the menu. Like what, what am I gonna be able to eat? I'd have a protein shake beforehand. I was constantly reading labels. Like half the time at the grocery store, I'd be like looking at all the ingredients, like concerned. And I noticed the space that it would take up in my mind. And I remember one time I had asked, cause I, I was just so like obsessed with my health. Well, what I thought was my health. Uh, that, you know, I realized like none of the Arbon stuff is certified organic. And I, I asked a question, I remember of an upline who was supposed to be like this wellness, like aficionado. And really, I, I don't even think she had any sort of like medical background or anything. She just called herself like a wellness coach. Like they all do. Yeah. It means nothing. But she had asked her, like, how come nothing in Arbonne is certified organic? But yet the whole 30 days healthy living program was like, you had to eat organic and clean and all these things and everything whole foods. And I actually like something clicked just one day, finally, after like eight years, I was like, this is all packaged stuff. This is packaged. And we're saying people can't eat packaged food and none of it's organic. And I was fed some BS line that was like, well, Arbonne's ingredient standards is actually better than organic. That's why we don't have the organic certification. And I remember calling bullshit. I was like, no, because if we met the standard, we could, we would still be able to put it on the packaging. And then, so because of the way it was affecting my mental health, I was like, I'm not going to promote the 30 days to healthy living program. So I removed myself from all the nutrition groups and that was the first crack in the armor and allowed me to like kind of create more space in my head, which was a good thing. That's awesome. Awesome. Yeah. But 
going back to like the profit thing, I was also stuck with a Mercedes payment. It wasn't was, free? No. So I earned the Mercedes after about three months of being in rank makers and then eventually spending the $5,000 to join Ray's inner circle coaching. And because it happened like three months after, again, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is all because of the almighty Ray Higdon. <laughs> And this is before he came out claiming to be a prophet, by the way. Right. And what was it so, actually from, though? If it, if it wasn't from Ray Higdon, what was it actually from? Just from being willing to lie more, which I guess you could yeah, say was I, from Ray. I, <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, regardless of what anyone thinks, like I didn't realize I was manipulating people more. But Ray, Ray would teach, like, don't tell people the company name. Which in Arbon, that was not something that we did. It, it was like, you got to have Arbon pride. So when I was a little bit more discreet, people would say yes before they mm. even knew what they were saying yes to. Smart. And the other thing too is, you know, I learned a little bit more like follow-up strategies. So maybe I got a little bit more organized and I just kind of became more annoying really with following up with people to the point where most people probably said yes, just to get me off their back. Um. And then it was just kind of like a culmination. Like I said, I was the first person in my area, like the height of social media. I learned like different social media tactics that worked for a time because why did I get stuck with that Mercedes payment? Because this is not a sustainable business model. Not only is it a, not a pyramid scheme, but even if you do have some success, it is not sustainable long-term. So I get to the level where I earn the Mercedes, I'm told you got to get your car, you know, take pictures, post it on social media, throw yourself a Ben's bash. This is a real thing, which is a recruiting tool, everything out of your own pocket. But you are told it's a business expense. It's a write off. It's a, um, you can bring people to it. They'll be able to see your car. People will be knocking down your door to join your business once they see that you've earned the Mercedes. So you'd be silly not to sign that mm -hmm. three year lease. What is the caveat of the Mercedes unlock? Like they, what did they pay for as part of that? So you had quotas that you had to hit every month. So my team, once I promoted to regional vice president, we were doing 40,000 in sales a month. And you have to hit 40,000 in sales consecutively to get an $800 car bonus. 4,000? 40,000 oh or God. zero. So we were doing 40,000 in sales, but we, we had just come off of like a GTC, which is glo a global training conference. So all the new products had been released. That's why we promoted. And so once the novelty of the new products were off, it was harder and harder to keep those numbers up there. And I was told that it was me. I I was even told by an upline, like, I think you're spending too much time with this Ray Higdon because they had seen me like stepping back from Arbonne and like kind of doing more of like the rank makers way. And that was like, I was like the black sheep of Arbonne because I wasn't doing it the way that they, they taught. And um, yeah, and my business was, was dipping and, I even had an upline tell me, well, it's because you spent too much time planning your Ben's bash when I was told I had to have that. I got stuck with the payments. My husband and I got stuck with the payments. And luckily, it didn't hurt us because my husband has a very good job. Like a lot of people in Arbonne, their significant other is funding their little yes. side hustle. Yes, yes. And that's why there's so much friction between spouses sometimes when it comes to MLM, because it's like, for example, I know a guy, I won't give too many specifics because he's a family friend, but I know a guy who his wife was spending his, he was in like, he was a medical professional. He's a doctor and his wife just for like decades spent all of his money basically on you name it, Lioness, Vima, 
um, she was in a bunch and uh, they eventually did divorce because she was never even around, which is, again, the ultimate irony. Not only did you not achieve financial freedom, not only did you embarrass yourself countless times and burn all your bridges with people who every time the phone rang with your name showing up, they didn't even want to answer because they knew it was going to be a new thing, a new pitch. And it, it ended up getting divorced anyways. And it's like, wow, it, it's really it's a shame. I don't know what uh, in her situation caused her to, you know, never get out. But um, yeah, I'm glad that for you and, and your husband, like you did have that sort of security that it wasn't such a thing that caused a huge, you know, thing between y'all. I'm, I'm incredibly lucky that he supported me with like, I think that if he would have come at me, like <laughs> you're in a cult mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of thing, I, you know, it wouldn't have worked. I was too hard headed. I was too much of a believer. Even if he did question some things, he did it in a very loving way. And it was like, I, I feel horrible that I took advantage of our relationship and like our finances and all of those things. Um, and I'm very lucky that it didn't end up the way that many MLM relationships end up. And so because my business was kind of at a standstill again, after, even though I hit the next rank, I got this Mercedes, everything looks great. Like it's not progressing anymore. In fact, it's going backwards. So when the Higdon group reached out to me to say, wow, we see you, you know, you went through our program and you're having all this success. We're looking for coaches. We'd love to offer you a position to become a coach. I thought this is a great way as my business is kind of like, because there's a real fear of sustaining it, keeping up appearances. Like you, you get so deep in. And so I'm like, this is a way to bring in like a steady stream of income and eventually do the thing that I want to do is represent the entire industry of MLM. And so I became a coach for the Higdon group. And I did that for three years. And exactly like you were saying, if I had to choose like the good that came out of it, it was, I listened to people across all different companies over and over again, like pour their blood, sweat, tears, heart, and soul into their MLMs and just lose. They were doing everything they were told to do. And here I was like seemingly winning, even though I was technically losing and they were not. And I, I, I could, I, it was heartbreaking to listen to. And as a coach, like we were kind of just told to tell people like it's just their mindset and <laughs> then they need to buy Ray's next course and like that'll fix it. Of and course. It really, it really became this thing where all of a sudden I'm just now selling all of Ray's things. And a friend of mine, a mutual friend, Julie Anderson, who I had known from being in rank makers. I mean, we were both diehard rank makers had left. And, you know, if people hadn't, haven't seen her interview that you did with her, like go watch it because Ray had done some things to her that like, I knew she was speaking truth. I saw her speaking out. I listened to her. I actually had dental surgery and I was a coach. And I got it pre-arranged and everything. Like we didn't get sick time or any sort of benefits as a coach, like everything. There was so much unpaid work, like even more than in MLM. I was paid per session when I met with a client, like in a Zoom and had like a coaching session. But yet I'm answering emails. I'm doing marketing for rank makers. I'm, I'm creating Facebook groups. I I'm tuning into all this Ray stuff so we can get like, we're basically like becoming him. Little like little mini Ray Higdons that are like just spewing his doctrine. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so I want to ask about becoming a rank maker. First of all, 
did you leave Arbon to do rank makers full time or are we still technically in Arbon at nope. the time? All Both. simultaneously. So no I'm time freedom it. whatsoever. Absolutely not. Okay. Like, Secondly, you know, go on. No, absolutely no time freedom. The second thing I wanted to ask about that is what was the, I know, I think I already know the answer, but what was the training process to become validated to be a coach for Ray? What did you, what did it take for you to become a rank maker coach? My guess is you just had to spend a fuck ton of money. You just had to go through his inner circle coaching program and create a success story for him. And it costs money. Yeah. It, it was a $5,000 <laughs> investment. <laughs> my and God. My success story was going to create a great marketing, you know, angle for him. And right. And a lot of what we were promised was not like payment. It was like exposure. It was like, stay close to me and you're going to be on all these stages. It, at one point, he created the speaking team that I also tried out for and got on. And he told, he said, we're going to make a team of million dollar speakers. And like, we went through this whole training process and nothing, like nothing ever came out of that. And so it, it it was just crazy. So I'm having dental surgery and I take a day off because I literally like can't speak. Okay. And my friend Julie Anderson is making anti MLM content on TikTok. And I finally am in this space where I can just sit and watch her videos. And I was like, everything she's saying is true. And it just like hit me. Like it was kind of that moment for me, like, oh my God, I'm in a cult. Wow. And so I did some questioning on my own. Uh, you know, that was in December of 2021. January of 2022, my upline loses her husband, tragically. He was super young um, and it was just, it was unexpected. And I didn't want to, like, I thought I was going to quit Arbon, but because she had just lost her husband, like I felt obligated to stay for her. Like I felt like she needed support. And then what happened was her upline, our upline leaders, used his death to promote Arbon, And they were reaching out to people on my team and they were like, could you just please hold a few events because so-and-so lost her husband and she really needs you to step it up. So she wasn't doing this. The upline leaders were. And when the people on my team, because they didn't do it to me, I think they knew that like I was already kind of out and I don't know. But my teammates started coming to me and saying, like, they're asking us to do events to help so-and-so, like, and I'm like, if they really cared about the fact that her husband passed away, they would donate money. They would start a, like a meal train. They would, yeah. they would, this is not, this has nothing to do with her losing her husband. This has everything to do with building their own Arbon business. That was the final straw with Arbon. Um, I didn't renew. I'm like <laughs> pretty much like F this. And um, but I still had coaching with Ray. And I still was like, if I, I can't lose all this income at once. Like I I didn't have like a financial plan, even though I thought I wasn't really making money, but in my brain, I'm like, I, I mean, I was making some like something. And, um, but then it's like everything accelerated. And I know like there's that cult psychologist, Yanya Lalich, who says it's like a shelf in the yeah. back of your mind and like <laughs> all these doubts get piled on it. And then all of a sudden the shelf breaks and the shelf broke for me in a meeting with Ray, where I was already questioning. I already knew all these things that he had done to Julie, um, where he basically told us it doesn't matter 
like if somebody needs coaching, your job as a coach is to sell them coaching. So we came to him, we had a meeting with him once a month where we'd come to him with like questions about our clients and a colleague of mine at the time who is still in, who is still a coach for him said, I have so many clients struggling with mental health. And like all of us were like nodding our heads because everybody was struggling. He, um, they're struggling. And, you know, I feel like just telling them to do the work anyway, which was like raise solution for any, everything was like, you know, your kid passes away, do it anyway. You know, you have a major surgery, do it anyway. Like mm -hmm. that was kind of like this mantra that was indoctrinated into every rank maker. And so when they were like, you know, this, th these people are struggling with their mental health. I feel like telling people to do it anyway is kind of dangerous. He took it upon himself in that meeting to promote his book, which he, at the time he had said he was coming out with, it's called defiance. And he said the word defiance and I recognize the NLP. He said the word defiance like 37 times. That's not an exaggeration. And so I started to hit record on the meeting. And if anyone wants to see like how it all went down, I actually have a highlight on my Instagram that is the whole thing. But he basically ignored the question and was like, we need to get them in. You, if you are not selling them again on another coaching package, you are not serving them at the highest level. And he must have seen like the look on my face or something because then he called me out and he did it like in that way where like a dude tells a woman to smile more, yeah. which totally like set me off. And he was like, Ryla, so my last name is Ryla. He's like, Ryla, what's with the face? Like, or, and, and I was like, he's like, what's up? And I'm like, nothing. What's up with you? And I, for the first time, I did not fawn at his feet and he didn't know how to handle it. And I said, I think what you are doing is wrong. And I finally see it. And you have taken, you've taken this time instead to sell your book rather than help these people that are paying you money. You are taking it upon yourself to pitch your book and pitch more coaching and I basically said, I can't be a part of this Ooh. anymore. And I started to, and this is all in a highlight again on my Instagram stories. You can see the whole thing. I recorded the meeting I put it all together in like a sequence. Um, so people can see. And I, with, within 24 hours, I was removed from all of the groups. Wow. So what happened in the rest of that? Is, what was his response? Did he just kick you from the Zoom? What did other people do? <laughs> what happened? So there's this one part where, because you know how MLM people like to call everything hate. Yeah, yeah. I'm literally saying like, I don't think this is good advice. The what we're doing to people, I think it's wrong. And he sits back and he like crosses his arms and he's like, well, if you've hated it here so much and you hate what we're doing and he says hate like five times and I go, I'm like, excuse me, excuse me. Cause he's just rambling on, right? He's just like to listen to himself talk. And I'm like, not afraid of him at this point. Like it was so weird. Like this whole, this just feeling overcame me. Like I'm not afraid of him anymore. Like yeah. I do not need to fawn at this man's feet. I was like, Ray, Ray. And I'm like saying his name and I'm like, can you hear me? Can you hear me? And he pauses and I go, I never said hate. And you can actually see in the video, he like deflates and he's like, oh, like, and I realized like I could see through him at that point. And once he realized that he didn't have power over me, he completely deflated. And so I actually had to get off the meeting because I had a coaching call because I was still like technically working for him. And after I got off, you know, some of my colleagues, some of them rushed to his aid to say like they didn't agree with me, that they thought that what they're, you know, like 
totally fawning at him. And I get it. We're in a cult. <laughs> He's the leader. Um, Some of them like kind of said that they could see where I was coming from. But then his response was, you know, I'm glad this happened because this is a perfect example of what happens when you don't deal with re resentment. And he pitched it like, I have a problem. I don't, I'm not a master of my emotions or my mindset. And I have resentment that's unresolved. And I took it out on him and he's the victim. Oh, go fuck yourself, which, Ray. Which is a classic narcissist move. But again, I could see it. Like all the things that I like had taken that time to question and learn about, like learn about cults, learn about narcissistic, narcissistic behavior, like leading up to this. It like, it's like, I could see it. It was like checking everything. And um, he sent me a message on Facebook messenger that was like the classic, like, I'm sorry, you feel that I'm, I'm sorry. You've let it get to a level where you feel that way. Yeah. And then within 24 hours, I was removed from all the groups. I did not say goodbye to any of my coaching clients. I was content was made about me the same way that it was made about Julie. People who I thought were my friends, like completely blocked me. They sent me horrific messages, like saying, after all Ray and Jessica have done for you, you should be ashamed of yourself to like basically saying that I hate women, you know, all the classic stuff. And it really hurt. Like, and I know anyone who's left an MLM like understands because you really believe that the, these people are your friends and it's sad. Mm. And I started making content because I care about those people and I lost a lot and I know that they're losing a lot too. And I just want them to get out and yeah. know that wow. they're enough and they don't need this profit to help them get yeah. there. Well, I'm so proud of you for standing up to that douchebag. And, you know, a lot of people just leave silently and they realize what happened. But it's like, you know, these people like Ray, Eric, any MLM leader, it's like if they weren't so brazen and so ambitious and so over the top with their evil, they might get away with it for like a lot longer or never even get called out. It's like they do it to themselves. You know what I mean? So but I am happy that 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 you got to that point where you where you weren't afraid of him anymore. And it's also there's a parallel between your story with the dental surgery. Uh, that was the first moment you really had to take a breath that you were able to take a breath and listen. That's exactly what happened to Steve Hassan when he was uh, when he got yeah. out of the Mooney's cult is he got in a car accident. He was in the hospital and that's when his family was able to actually get him away for a few days and deprogram him basically so that's a that's an amazing thing too and i again that is just i guess it's anecdotal but that is just further evidence to me that the time control that they have over your life is so key if you're so busy watching zoom calls prospecting people going on coaching calls blah 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 you have no time to think you're just doing stuff i'm also guessing you didn't get paid for that last uh, coaching call you did on the on on the day uh, I was meaning to ask how, how those I, worked out too. I actually did get okay. paid, but because it was a coaching call, but I don't know if, how familiar you are with the Nexium cult or, or that story or anything, but I know like the DOS women, the people who are like in Keith Raniere's inner circle talk about doing readiness drills where like they had to have their phone on them. And, and like, if their master slave like texted them, they had to be ready that's what it was like working for Ray. I will say like minus the sexual part, <laughs> thank God. But like there, it was like you constantly had to be ready because if Ray needed you to go live on his public page doing an interview or someone from his team or if they were going to put out a challenge. So I was like, when I said yes, like there's always like that question, like, would you have said yes if you knew exactly what you were saying yes to, you know? I thought I said yes to like a coaching thing on my terms, like 
a couple times a week. And it ended up being like, I didn't know what I would have to do for inner circle every day. Like, because it was, it was just as you went and you were expected to be grateful because look how successful and wealthy Ray is. And if you just do what he says, you will be successful and wealthy too. Not realizing that he's completely exploiting your labor. Like it's, I mean, this is speculative. This is my opinion. It's labor trafficking. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I also wanted to ask, how did you, this goes back to the financial thing. How did you actually get paid for the coaching calls? You would do a call with someone for 30 minutes or an hour. And then how did it, how did it work? Yeah. So we were, we were paid $22 a session. And sometimes those sessions were half an hour. Sometimes they were an hour and which is not a lot. I actually had to ask for a raise after working there for a couple of years. And, and because I was the person that they gave a lot of the difficult clients to and shout out to Julie Anderson, because she always jokes that that's why I was her coach because she was difficult, (laughs) but I, because I was getting so many difficult clients, I finally like asked for a raise and I was making like 24, $25 an hour or not an hour, a session. And, um, yeah. And, but I would get, if we, if we did like a live video on Ray's page, like anytime we showed our face to a client or like on his public page, that counted as like a session that we get paid for, but there were meetings and like answering emails and like messaging clients and like posting things. Like there was so much unpaid work, but we're all in MLM. So we're all like, this is normal. This is what you have to do to be successful. Well, it's also a crap deal because they're paying $5,000 to Ray and you're getting paid 22 a session. Yes, exactly. And I see it now. Marco, where were you three years ago? I was, I mean, I, to be fair, I did put out my first couple of pyramid scheme videos uh, in 2019, but I wasn't consistent with the MLM content. I didn't actually, you know, I didn't realize how big this was. I put out two videos about World Financial Group in 2019. They did well. I thought they did well just because they were like good viral content and that, you know, people knew this company in my city. And then a year later, I did uh, a video about ACN. And I thought maybe it was the same thing. You know, I worked really hard on the video. It was a well put together video. So maybe it was just a similar thing. You know, Trump was in the video. I thought, okay, maybe that was what it was about because, you know, it was 2020, Trump, Biden, whatever. And then as I went, I realized like, I would just have so many people reaching out to me about check out this company, this company, this company. I didn't really realize until 2021 what it was. And so I was pretty consistent in 2021. And then in 2022, I was away completely because uh, there was a lot that happened that I uh, I had not seen happen to any other creators. And I re- I knew that I had really like pissed off some mm-hmm people in the industry, which felt good in a way, but also yeah. it was like, okay, I, I I had to reassess like, okay, do I want to spend the rest of my like young adult years uh, fighting lawsuits and whatever, whatever. And, you know, is that going to be a good life for me to live? Uh, but eventually I realized there are ways, um, there are ways that I can handle those types of things and, and be able to still do this so that's why these multi-level misery like episodes are really important because i would have probably seen those videos like on acn world financial group whatever and been like well those are the financial mlms my mlm is different but when you hear stories from people i think it is easier to see yourself in like their story and and when you have stories like people in like the wellness companies or the Mm -hmm. beauty companies. I I'm just glad I'm out now. (laughs) Yeah, no, I'm glad you are too. And I want to sort of tie this up in a beautiful bow. You went from Arbon, you then got into rank makers and then because you needed even more self-improvement and you were already in this self-help pipeline, Tony Robbins. And it was Tony Robbins who 
you know, encouraged you to do a profit loss. And the profit loss showed you that despite thinking you were making, you know, around six grand a month, the expenses made it so that you were actually losing money. And this was such a revolving thing for, you said, eight years, right? That you didn't notice it until, I guess, that point, right? So what was that realization like? What was the conversation with your husband and the people around you when you decided, okay, I'm out? And what was the sort of uh, fallout? What was the effects that it had on your relationships personally, not like Rank Makers, Arbonne, like your your real life relationships? Yeah. Well, like I said, I mean, my husband, I, I'm so lucky. He, he, he loves me unconditionally. He's supported me deep into MLM and even coming out of it. And so that luckily has stayed solid. And my friends, I was worried. Like there was a lot of shame, like that I had failed. And I thought that like, people would think I was like a liar or that I was some stupid or whatever. But I had, when I started speaking out, I first started on TikTok because that felt safe. I didn't really do anything on Facebook. And then when I did my first Facebook post, like anti MLM Facebook post to say like, I'm no longer associated with this because of X, Y, and Z. I had tons of people, former friends, like express relief, like, oh my God, I'm so glad to hear that you're out. A friend that I had run like a nonprofit with, she was like, you know, when you stopped doing the nonprofit with me, like I knew it was because of Arbon, and I felt so sad for you, but like, I didn't know why it was because I didn't have time. She's like, because I loved working with you. And like, I would love to get it started again. If you if you'd like to. And like, that really meant a lot to me. I feel like my sisters, actually one of my sisters was in Arbon with me and I felt like it created a weird awkwardness in our relationship. She's like 14 years younger than me. And like, I felt like when Arbon was off the table and we could be sisters again, like it felt really really good yeah without that weird like oh i should be working my arbon business because my older sister is watching me kind of thing it, it was it was actually incredibly positive to all the people that um really cared about me who i had convinced weren't supportive of my business or supportive of me they absolutely 100 percent supported me Awesome. Uh, like me as a person, not yeah. me as an Arbon consultant. <laughs> good, good. I'm happy to hear that. All right. Now for the final big ugly question. You okay. made it pretty high in Arbon. You gave it your all. You weren't a part-timer. You you were fully in it. All in. You were Arbon was in me. <laughs> yes, Arbon was in you. You were a coach and rank makers. For somebody with all of these accolades. Uh, all of the money spent on trainings and your, you know, your mindset was probably pretty good. What is the estimate of the total over the eight years lost financially? It's probably close to a hundred thousand dollars. If you include the Mercedes. Oh yeah. If you include that, but like I traveled to industry events I traveled to Arbonne events. <laughs> um, even going to rank makers as a coach, I had to pay for. So it's a lot of travel over eight years. Yeah. And, <sighs> oh, this is like a lot to think about. Um, I also had like a team and when you have teammates going with you, like there's this expectation that you've got to make it this lavish, like experience to keep them around. And so I went all out. I got team gifts. We were encouraged. Do you want to get team gifts? Do you want to show how thankful you are to your teammates? Man. There are so many little expenses that, I quite frankly, don't even want to think about. Sure, sure. And I know, again, that 
the MLM apologists would say, oh, well, she didn't have to do anything. She didn't have to do any of that. But it's like, well, you can't not do it, though, as well. Then it's weaponized against you. Exactly. Well, you maybe, have that's, maybe that's not why you are where you want to be, because you're not sh- you're not la- uh, showering your team with gifts. You're, you're not, not coachable. going to the events. Yeah. Yeah. You're not duplicatable. You're not coachable. You don't. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. So it's a again, it's just a gaslighting technique for them to weaponize that or say, well, she didn't have to, whatever, whatever. But yeah, so, I mean, I've never been in that spa before, but because like I said, I've never been in MLM. Full full disclaimer for those who want my my disclaimer, right? <laughs> um, was it was it sort of one of those things where like your, the, the number in your bank account would go up, like your bank account would get bigger, but the expenses would get bigger? Or did your bank account basically stay the same and it was just sort of like a revolving thing where you thought I'm reinvesting back into my business and that's why it's the same. Okay. Yeah. Got I'm it. Re- and then as you get more success, you just spend more money. Yeah. Like you're just like, you're hiring more expensive coaches. So I went from hiring Ray to Tony Robbins, you know? So I'm like, I'm making more money. I can, I can go for Tony Robbins. And the reason the reason why I invested in Tony Robbins is because I didn't have any training working for Ray. And that always felt weird. I always felt like I, I want to be the best coach I can be, but there was no like training offered to us. It's not like Ray was like, here, let me pay for you to go get this certification. And I wanted to put myself ahead of the, like everybody, I wanted to be the best coach I could be. So I'm like, who's the best coach? Right. It's Tony Robbins. So I'm like, if I do that, I'm going to be the best coach. Ray's going to notice me. I'm going to make, I'm going to make more money. I'm, I'm going to, it was like all right. a part of this, like vision that like was just based on false hope. Yeah. And so did you, I know you mentioned, I think it was a, a large amount, five figures that you paid for Tony Robbins. Would, would, did you actually get one-on-one like training with Tony Robbins or was it like you went to a seminar, like you went to one of the group things? I got training with one of his coaches, uh-huh. but so I, I attended his like wealth mastery, business mastery, life mastery, unleash the power within and date with destiny. So I went to all of those events. Okay. And then because I went to all those events, now I'm a a Tony Robbins Mastery University graduate. Nonsense. <laughs> and I learned all the special techniques that have helped Tony, you know, go from whatever to whatever. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I, I really do hope that there's no guilt associated with your experience in MLM because there is no reason to feel guilty. You were professionally, your mind was professionally manipulated you were professionally taken advantage of and they preyed on the most like instinctual of human needs like your maternal desire to like spend time with your children and stuff you you didn't you you didn't stand a chance frankly and uh i am really happy to see that there are people you know like it's so amazing you and julie were on the same team and you're both like vocally speaking out and you know that's just amazing to me because in the past that's what was missing. Like even one generation behind, if it was like, you know, my parents or your parents' generation uh, being in, you know, Mary Kay or Amway or something like that, Avon, they probably would have just said, oh yeah, I did that for a time, but they wouldn't have made a thing about it because they didn't have the resources we have now to understand, like to go read up, like what is a narcissist? What is a sociopath? Like to be able to spot it. So I'm so happy that uh, this is a thing now. Anti-MLM is a thing. And They've they people like Ray, Eric, they have had no pushback for so long. They've controlled the narrative for so long. And now we live in a time where one guy in his apartment making a YouTube video can be the first search result when you search the name of a company. And I I I know that we have more power, regardless of how much money they have. It costs me nothing to to control the narrative. So I'm really happy that you're contributing to that. I, I'm happy too. Like I 
when I say I was all in, I was all in. And I just always like try to leave every interview with just saying this one last thing. Like take the most obsessed MLM person. That was me. And so if like you have loved ones that are in that seem just like this is their whole life, there is no way they'll ever get out. Like there is hope. So in a sense, I'm still maybe selling hope, but like I, it, it, it truly don't give up on them. Don't give up on them. Like keep like asking questions in a loving way. Keep getting them to critically think. And it's just, it's really just a matter of time before their shelf breaks too, because there are doubts. Yeah, I, I like yeah. what Steve Hassan said in his book. Don't argue with people. Empower people to think critically. Exchange ideas. Listen to them and watch the video and do the, you know, listen to what their edified mentor has to say. And then say, okay, well, are you open to listening to something I have to share with you? And make it yes. not a, make it something you discover together, not something you argue about. I wish I would have known that sooner because I think I could, could have helped a lot more people that way too. But, um, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm getting uh i'm getting more more tools in my toolbox as i go which i you know the mlm people should be worried about and i know they are worried about it so i'm i'm gonna keep going and i know you're gonna keep going so yeah, yeah. and I, I made a lot of mistakes too when i first left i because i was healing simultaneously i didn't do the thing where you heal first and then speak out like i felt like this sense of urgency and so i've made mistakes too and it's there's still hope. So thank you so much. Hell yeah. Well, thank you, Jennifer, for taking the time to talk to me. I know this is going to be really helpful to whoever watches it. And uh, yeah, don't, don't, don't join an MLM, y'all. It's a, in case you haven't got the memo by now, it's not good. <laughs> <laughs>